So welcome to The Shape of Freedom, a virtual tour with Daniel Zamani and guests uh, Katerina Klim and Jason Andrew with Artists Estate Studio. Uh, the exhibition, The Shape of Freedom, ends on September 25th in Potsdam. Uh, a, a selection of works will then travel to the Albertina in Vienna for an opening of October 15th, and then to the Munch Museet in Oslo, February 22nd, 2023. Uh, Daniel is joining us from Potsdam, Katerina from London, and Jason is in Brooklyn, and I am as well. Daniel Zamani is curator at Museum Barberini Potsdam. He received his PhD in the history of art from the University of Cambridge. In January 2018, he joined the curatorial team of the Museum Barberini, where he works on exhibitions on 19th and 20th century painting. Shows which Dan curated or co-curated include the exhibitions Matisse Bonnard, Long Live Painting, 2017, Monet Places, 2019, and The Shape of Freedom, International Abstraction After 1945, which is what we'll be discussing today. Forthcoming projects include a major show on surrealism and magic, as well as exhibitions on Maurice de Vlamont, Camille Pissarro, and Paul Signa. Also joining us is Katerina Klim. She is the director of ASSOM, which is a private collection located in Geneva and started in the early 2000s as a dialogue between European avant-garde and American post-war abstraction. ASSOM is a lender to the exhibition. The collection supports a transnational vision of art history and invites questions and expands the established canons of art and has supported since its inception the work of women artists. She oversees the collection's development and its active loan program and is in charge of partnerships with international public institutions and philanthropic initiatives. Prior to ASOM, Katerina worked at Christie's as a contemporary art specialist and at Cahir Dart Publishing House. She holds a BA in art from the Louvre School and MA from HEC Paris. She is a member of Tate North American Acquisitions Committee and supporter of AWARE Archive of women artists. And last, we have Jason Andrew, who is the curator and manager of the estate of Janice Biala. Since 2004, Jason has been leading the estate, stewarding the artist's legacy through research, curation, and special events like this. He has lectured and published extensively on Janice Biala and is currently compiling the forthcoming catalog resume of works. He is my co-founder of Artist Estate Studio. Again, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will address them as we go. And I would like to hand over to Jason Andrew. Thank you, Julia. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is a very exciting uh, event. I wanna thank Dan and Katerina for making the time to discuss this historic exhibition, which closes on the 25th in Potsdam. Um, I wanted to personally thank and congratulate Dan uh, on this, not only on the specifics of this curation, but also congratulate him on the magnitude of the idea, an exhibition that examines the creative interplay between abstract expressionism and its counterpart, art infernal in Western Europe. It's an incredible transatlantic exchange of dialogue between artists, and we get to see that through this fluidity uh, of the exhibition. Um, so if I'm going to outline basically how we're going to run today. Dan's going to lead us through the exhibition, which is really the, the purpose of uh, effort, the big effort of, of doing this. I'm very curious to, to walk through the show and see some of the, uh, the works that he's put together, his different juxtapositions. If you have questions, let's get those in the chat, after which I'm going to introduce um, Janice Biala and, and, and Hedda Stern. Um, and that will lead into a more specific uh, discussion of Hedda's work with Katerina. Um, great, so let's get right on to it. Uh, Dan, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and we'll sit back and we'll take a look. I hope it will work in a second and you can all see it well and hear me, right? 
Yes, I, I can see and it looks great. Brilliant. So uh, on my screen, I currently can't see your, um, your other cameras, but if there are any questions or if anything shouldn't work all right, then please do let me know. And of course, thank you so much for your kind invitation, Jason. I'm really excited to be here with you today and um, give you a little sneak peek, if you like, of the exhibition. Um, so what we're seeing here is a 360 degree virtual tour we're put together and it's actually available also on our website. So um, everyone's very welcome to explore it by themselves. Um, Perhaps to introduce the exhibition, it's um, been a project I've been working on since the end of 2018, uh, so quite a long time in the making, um, which I think you also need for an exhibition of that magnitude. It's um, an exhibition of 97 works by more than 50 artists, uh, all of whom were either active in the field of uh, European alpha male painting in Western Europe or in the wider orbit of abstract expressionism in the United States. And we've culled the uh, selection of images from more than 35 lenders. Um, so many of the names you would expect, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, uh, the Museo Nacional de Saint-Bon in Misa um, in Madrid. But also that was very important for us, um, a lot of private collections. And uh, perhaps some of the um, highlights of the exhibition really are um, lesser known names with great works that um, I think need to have more attention also in the public eye. And um, we've been particularly keen early on um, in the planning of the exhibition uh, to show the importance of women uh, in uh, both of these abstract movements in Europe uh, and America. Um, female figures like, for instance, the head of Stern and Janice Biala who were hugely influential in the development of these movements and who also played a role in the transatlantic dialogue, as we'll see. And indeed, more general also to uh, unpack what it actually means uh, to have this idea of um, abstraction as a free language of alpha male and uh, abstract expressionism in uh, America, Western Europe, so the Western world, if you like, in that Cold War language, because a huge amount of the protagonists um, in these movements actually had Eastern European origins. And uh, of course, I know that's also something that uh, Ekaterina and uh, the Asim collection are incredibly interested in. Um, so uh, this is the very first room when you um, enter the exhibition at the Barberini. And we actually decided to have um, this work here by uh, Janice Biala um, as a kind of, uh, I think, wonderful opener. Uh, it's um, uh, called Untitled, but it has uh, a subtitle still up with three glasses painted in 1962. And I think quite a lot of the themes that are investigating the show sort of run through the work. Uh, if you look at it in terms of um, the painting style, it's reminiscent of the um, late work of Matisse, which Biala, of course, knew for her stays in Paris. Uh, but it also has this kind of gestural energy, which you find in the work of the New York School painters like um, Ben de Koning, for instance. So you can really see that she has her eyes both on New York and on Paris. And um, I really like that uh, we have this quote, I think Jason also has it in one of his many publications on Biala, that when she was kind of asked where she um, felt most at home, whether in Paris or in New York, um, she said, I'm Jewish. I was born in a country where it was better not to be Jewish. Wherever you go, you're in a sense a foreigner. I always felt that wherever my easel was, that was my nationality. And um, I believe it's a very poignant quote because um, a lot of these artists uh, were not at all thinking in terms of, of rivalries of country, but they thought that abstraction after the Second World War was a kind of universal language. They thought of it in um, emancipatory terms. It was seen as a liberation from the shackles of the past. Uh, it was also a way forward in a traumatized society after not just the Second World War, but the revelations of the Holocaust and uh, especially I think in America also of that um, shock uh, of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Biala is of course incredibly interesting because she was actually born um, in Poland. Uh, she had this migratory experience, which uh, was something that a lot of the abstract expressionists shared. And of course she was a participant in the news developments after the war in Paris and New York. So I think a really nice way of, of entering um, the exhibition. And we've um, decided to put 
uh, Biala's painting here in the first room in a dialogue with, um, I think also one of the most important loans to the show. It's one of the many works that um, the Assam collection directed by Ekaterina Klim has very generously um, decided to support us with. Um, so the first painting here we enter and turn to the left is um, Hedda Stern's uh, New York number no. seven. It's part of a series she made in the 1950s completely dedicated to New York. Um, and it was very much about her experience of America being the safe haven after prosecution. Uh, she's a Jewish born um, artist from Romania who moved in the 1930s in uh, surrealist circles in Paris and then escaped to New York um, from persecution by the Nazis in the early 1940s. She was championed very early on by Peggy Guggenheim who was a highly visible force in the New York art world. And I think is uh, one of the many women artists, um, one of the many women in the movement who kind of disappeared from the art historical record really at a time when um, art historians trying to um, take stock, if you like, of the movement, uh, were painting a rather narrow picture. And I think that's certainly something uh, we see is now changing with more and more emphasis uh, on uh, female participants in the movement. Um, in the first room, and you can see it here in the size of course, these paintings as well by artists like uh, Adolf Gottlieb, uh, Jackson Pollock here with uh, the teacup of 1946, or also of um, uh, Asha Gorky, here, one of his most important pieces from 1945. Uh, next to him, this beautiful transitional Rothko, one of his multiform paintings from the Tate Modern in London. Like at the beginning, the Americans really very, very closely have their eyes set on developments in Europe, uh, specifically in, uh, in Paris. And in the room, it was important for us to recall to um, the general visitor, the importance of the new institutions in New York and the reason why America was kind of catching up with, with the Europe um, Museum of Modern Art founded in 1929. You've got the Museum of Non-Objective Painting, today the Solomon Roy Guggenheim Museum opened in 1939. Then you have um, Peggy Guggenheim's Gallery Art of the Century, uh, which I believe uh, opens in uh, 1942. And all these institutions bring amazing collections of European modernism uh, to US audiences. Most of the um, young and inspiring abstract expressionists, the name is not current yet, um, they have their studios in Manhattan, they spend time in these collections, and they really get the chance to simulate the newest developments in European painting. And um, Clem Greenberg, who arguably is the most important critic of the movement, he very early on actually said that it was this huge impact of the world-class collections of European modernism that gave these provincial artists, as he termed it, um, the chance to um, yeah, catch up with the most advanced painting culture of their time. Um, and what you see when you move into the second room of the exhibition is how once these artists sort of get into their own, they develop a really surprising uh, self-confidence. The formats become much larger. And whereas the first room has a lot of paintings that still linger in traditional genre with links to still life, uh, interior, sometimes also landscape, we have that much freer form of abstraction um, in, in later works of the 1950s and 1960s. It's incredibly energetic brushwork in uh, paintings like this one from uh, Deborah Remington, Dr. S of 1962. Uh, and of course, these very canonic artists um, uh, who really were the pioneers of action painting like um, uh, Willem de Koning um, or uh, indeed Franz Klein here with Zink Door from a private collection in Zurich. Uh, it's a painting that was seen very much as uh, an affirmation of individual freedom, of the painterly gesture as a sign that you leave the past behind, that you're not a slave to the objective world anymore. And what fascinates me as well about the abstract expression is, is this idea that as long as you paint a specific object, a specific location, there's always a sense of the geographical or the national, uh, it's always culturally circumscribed, if you like. And they wanted to paint in a very universal way and thought of abstraction as being something that can be understood on a purely emotional, purely intuitive limit. And so these uh, kind of grippings, the splashes of color in works by Norman Bloom, um, this uh, incredible fervor of uh, color and the liberation of color and form in, in works also by artists like uh, Mary Abbott uh, or Franz Klein, I'm already mentioned, really has to be seen as a, as a reaction against the past, against the academy, as an assertion of the individual and the idea of self-expression in art. 
and um, these gestural tendencies then um, very soon culminate in um, the all over effects, which are one of the um, yeah, hallmarks of abstract expressionist painting. So the idea that you have images that really renounce the very notion of background and foreground, um, often the painting is covered in really densely worked surface where you have no sense of upside down. You can often install the paintings either um, in portrait format or as a landscape, uh, like here in this beautiful work by Richard Pousset Dart. And of course, you have the, the same um, approach in, in the work by Jackson Pollock and his famous drip paintings that he develops from the late 1940s, uh, from uh, late 1946 onwards. Um, this is actually one of my favorite uh, installation views in the exhibition where we have Pollock's hugely iconic Enchanted Forest from the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice. And um, we've decided to frame him by four works by um, uh, Lee Krasner, who was, uh, of course, his, his partner and later his wife. And I think interestingly that when the two of them meet, it's uh, Krasner is by far the, um, the more famous artist. It's Krasner who introduces uh, Pollock to Hans Hofmann. And it's, it really starts to change when uh, Pollock gets this um, five-year scholarship by, uh, paid by Peggy Guggenheim. It allows him to um, resign from his position of custodian at the Museum of Non-Objective Painting. He has full time to spend on, on his experiments. And um, of course, he buys this um, estate in Long Island where he famously converts the large barn into this super spacious studio. So all of these iconic photographs by people like Hans Namut, where you can see Pollock dripping on the floor on these monumental canvases, uh, it's in his uh, barn studio. And of course, Krasner, who paints these little images at the same time, um, she's uh, working in the house in a room that uh, is used by both of them on very intimate small scale at a time where she also massively supports him. Uh, so she really um, has that role of a supporter, advisor, of a wife. And it's interesting that she really comes into her own only after Pollock's death in 1956, when she moves herself into that studio. And I think there's something incredibly telling about that kind of gender relationship in the work of the two artists. And also that Krasner for a long time was um, not as well known as Lee Krasner, the painter, but more as Lee Krasner, uh, who was Mr. Pollock in the eyes of many of these sort of very macho art historians constructing the genealogy of abstract expressionism. And, um, we have here, I think, as a really key loan, that beautiful bold eagle of 1955, which also belongs to the Assam collection. And we can actually see that Krasner includes in this collage work some of the um, drip paintings made by uh, Jackson Pollock. So uh, a, a nice way of getting into the dialogue. And um, perhaps just briefly show uh, this wall here, where we have this iconic small Pollock from the Museum Frida Burda, and we framed it by all over paintings by Janice Biala and by Pearl Fine. Um, again, not to say that Pollock wasn't a great artist, but to show that he was working in a specific creative environment where a lot of other players were at work at the same time and who unjustly are not represented enough. This one uh, here, Illusion of Solidity, also from the Assam collection, is actually a drip painting that she made around 1945 and Sobel, who came from Ukraine, had exhibitions of her drip paintings in Peggy Guggenheim's uh, Art of the Century Gallery where New York, uh, Pollock was under contract in that time. And interesting, of course, that Pollock sees these drip paintings by Sobel, and then he starts dripping a few months later uh, at the end of 1946. So again, an interesting story that I think needs to be um, discussed or explored much further. And um, I'll be going through these rooms a lot quicker now um, seeing that um, Stern and Biala were, were central to the first section of the exhibition, but we then traced the evolution of abstract expressionism through that second big idiom, color field painting, where we have this, um, I think, very impressive gallery space where we got key works by all of the major protagonists of color field painting in the US, um, important works by uh, Clifford Still, uh, by Robert Motherwell, uh, Ed Reinhardt here with one of his iconic black on blacks, We've got two major works by um, Barnett Newman from the Tate Modern in London, Adam and Eve. Um, further works here by Stamos Gottlieb. Three large Rothkos, which really sort of dominate the room. Um, one of them from the Whitney Museum of American um, Art. And then this 
beautiful piece here by um, by Tokov, which reminds me a bit of kind of almost looks like a curtain of rain, but a really wonderful mixture of that purity of color field painting and then that sort of gestural energy with this wonderful overlay here in the lighter colors and um, using Gottlieb as a sort of springboard. Uh, we then have one room dedicated entirely to the staining technique um, heralded by Helen Frankenthaler, here a key loan from the Frankenthaler Foundation and reframed her works, uh, Bending Blue and After Rubens, here with a beautiful cascade of three of the um, paintings by uh, Morris Lewis, who really came to the staining technique in these sort of veil paintings through Frankenthaler and uh, here again, sort of one of the key loans to the show, Safé from 1959, also lent by the Assam collection, sort of, to my mind, one of Lewis's most beautiful paintings. And uh, Greenberg, of course, loved the fact that he used this extremely thin paint that he um, poured onto the canvas. It completely stains the fiber. So there's no sense anymore that the color sits on top of the support. But if you like, the canvas itself becomes an object with this very, as a real kind of light. We had one room that we entirely dedicated to the uh, dialogue of um, Sam Francis and uh, Joan Mitchell. And here two of uh, these really impressive monumental canvases uh, by Francis. And the reason why we showed him a dialogue with, uh, with Mitchell was not just that they were part of the second generation of abstract expressionism, but that both of them had important links to Paris. Um, Francis really developed his, his mature idiom in France, if you like. He uh, came to abstract expressionism through his knowledge of uh, Rothko, uh, Still, and, and Gorky. But it's in the early 1950s that he moves in Aphromel circles in Paris. He has his first one-man show at the gallery of Nina Dossier. And he's a huge admirer of the French coloristic tradition. So artists like um, Claude Monet and Pierre Bonnard, for instance, he spends a lot of time at the newly um, uh, reopened uh, Musée de l'Orangerie, where he sees these large cycles of Monet's um, water lilies. And you can see in, in, in works by both artists, uh, be it here by, um, uh, by uh, John Mitchell or in the works of um, uh, Sam Francis, that you have a very distinct dialogue with that impressionistic uh, brushwork, often with paintings that have titles that also allude to inspiration found in nature. And um, in our tour for the museum, we used these painters who uh, were part of the Parisian post was seen as a way of then accessing um, the first room dedicated to uh, European Aphromel uh, with a focus in Paris, where you have very similar strands going on. And interestingly, of course, the Aphromel painting is very early on received very well in America. A lot of exhibitions that showcase um, European artists working in abstract idioms. Uh, like Jean-Paul Riopelle, um, like Alberto Puri, um, Emilio Vedova, uh, Jean Dubuffet, um, or in, indeed Götz and Fautrier. And there's similar strands. We have that um, experimentation with, with color and form. You have an appreciation of new materials, the rejection of, of figuration. You have that sort of very visceral idea of paint application. But there's a sense of brutality often to the paintings that you don't have in American painting. And I would argue that you can see that these are artists who are traumatized to a different degree by the war that many of them had lived through firsthand, not vicariously like the Americans. And a lot of time it's, of course, artists that have also suffered under fascist dictatorships and also under the occupation in France. Um, uh, we have uh, here, painters in the exhibition like um, Dubuffet, for instance, um, who of course was uh, very much uh, of this opinion that after the revelations of the Holocaust, after Second World War, you couldn't go back to traditional aesthetic norms. So he propagated this notion of a, an art bru, as he called it, of a kind of raw art that was also um, harking back to ideas of, uh, you know, sort of street art, outsider art, art of children, art of the insane, prehistoric painting, and uh, a lot of the artists we show in this room, like um, uh, Tapies, Serpan, uh, they embrace this idea. And this uh, wall here was really important to us uh, in uh, putting the exhibition together in terms of this dialogue that you can see here between um, Emilio Vedova, Antonio Saura, and Alberto Buri, 
all artists who um, developed an anti-fascist stance, all artists who were working through or with trauma, and in three paintings that all of them in their own way are reflections on their experience of the war. Um, and just perhaps to show them just a bit more closely, you can see here in, in Sarah's action painting, again a painter who's from Spain. Um, he's uh, one of the very outspoken enemies of the Franco regime, but his eyes are on developments in, in Paris and in New York at the same time, or um, later of our image of time, actually shown at Documenta 2 in 1959, which is a critique of the modern cult of technology, also alludes to war and destruction. Or in Buri's work, we often have these wounds made by um, burnings on plastic surfaces. Again, an artist who was actually um, in American captivity uh, during uh, the Second World War, then uh, traveled to Paris where he was enthusiastic about the um, experimentation by artists like Dubuffet and Waltz, and also an artist who really came to the fore, came to his own when he was exhibited hugely uh, in the US in the 1950s, I believe in the first time in, in exhibitions put on by um, James Johnson Sweeney, who was the director of the Guggenheim in New York. And um, from this introduction to European art formal and these artists working through trauma, we then have a whole room dedicated to European action painting, to artists who see paintings done by um, role models, if you like, uh, such as Jackson Pollock or Willem de Koning. Um, Pollock's work uh, is exhibited in a big uh, one-man show in Paris in the early 1950s. A lot of the young artists in Paris had already seen his work at the um, 1948 Biennale where Peggy Guggenheim showed her collection uh, in the Greek pavilion. And um, for instance, um, uh, Georges Mathieu here was hugely influenced by, by Pollock's um, tripping and um, he made these beautiful calligraphic works that were executed very rapidly and was celebrated in New York as a European counterpoint to Pollock. He was very visible in New York with acquisitions made by the Art of Chicago, uh, by the Museum of Modern Art, also by the um, Guggenheim Museum. Uh, so these Afromel painters were shown in New York at a time when the abstract expressionists were finding their own. And it's a kind of dialogue that has not been explored to, the day, uh, to this day in which uh, we want to sort of um, also um, put on the table, if you like, to hopefully be explored further. Um, I don't think there's to this day uh, a single study on the American reception of Afromel, which was be an incredible topic for a PhD. Um, you see here further works by Mathieu, um, and these beautiful paintings here by Judith Reigl, who was an artist who actually came from Budapest to Paris. She had seen Corning and, and Pollock's work at the Biennale, um, where Peggy Guggenheim played such a central role, and then followed developments in uh, the New York School by subscriptions of magazines from America. So again, interesting how these artists, often without traveling to the US, uh, very, very uh, much knew uh, what was going on uh, in New York. Uh, and here is, is another painter, uh, Jean Degotex, with this beautiful painting, Furieux, from the Centre Pompidou. He was one of the many artists who went to see um, the one-man show that was dedicated to Pollock at the studio Paul Facchetti, and who then started with their own um, dripping techniques inspired by American action painting. And to just briefly um, round up the exhibition we have in here in Potsdam in the show, we put a big focus in the last section on um, actually German painters who are perhaps not as well known abroad as they deserve to be and who interestingly often were better known in, in France and the US um, in, in the early um, periods of their career. We have here these beautiful disc paintings by Ernst Wilhelm Nye actually represented uh, Germany at the Venice Biennale, I believe in 1956 with a selection of these disc paintings. At the uh, third documenta, they were shown as a visual dialogue piece with the um, abstract expressionist paintings by um, Sam Francis. And now it's interesting, like a lot of the German artists, in that the German post abstraction was often painters who were either deemed um, uh, degenerate during the Nazi regime, who in the Nazi period between 1933 and 1945 were not allowed to exhibit nor uh, really to paint and thus excluded from any kind of artistic dialogue, also who, of course, couldn't leave Germany. Uh, or you had painters like um, Winfred Gaul here with a painting that always reminds me of the work of Joan Mitchell, Couleur Signification, um, or uh, works by um, his colleague, um, Bernard Schulze. Um, they were artists who um, essentially spent their youth on the Eastern Front fighting for uh, a regime 
uh, that they personally didn't subscribe to and who often started um, painting as a kind of way to, um, to come through trauma. So Schultz, for instance, was very much inspired by the works by Waltz you could see in Paris in the 1950s. And for the Germans, really, Paris was the gateway to America because uh, the abstract expressionists were shown very frequently in Paris from the early 1950s onwards. And all these German artists who were traveling to Paris could also see the work of painters like uh, Pollock or Koning. And Schultz was one of the many artists who always said that um, Pollock was sort of the second big revelation for the uh, Germans uh, on top of the works by uh, Waltz. Or here you have um, Karl Otto Goetz, uh, mm -hmm. with one of his most significant late paintings, Giverny. He actually traveled to Paris in the 1950s. He saw the first exhibition with works by Koning and by Pollock. And when he returns to Germany, he starts with his own type of action painting. He puts the canvas on the floor like Pollock did and then uses squeegees to very quickly make these um, amazing uh, action paintings. You have a similar sense of the liberation of color in them as you find in works uh, at the same time of the New York School. And then the last room, we kind of um, finish, I think, with a bit of a smile with this work here by Winfried Gaul, who was invited by no one less than Clem Greenberg to visit New York in 1962. He spent several, time, uh, several months there. He met a lot of the painters who were the pioneers of abstract expressionism. He could also see all the iconic works by Pollock, Rothko, and Co. Um, in the big collections in New York. And then one of the paintings he made as an homage to it was this homage to Rothko, which, of course, is much more harder than Rothko, so it also proclaims a kind of artistic independence from the role models. But you have other painters who in Germany very clearly look at what's happening in America. Um, Ruprecht Geiger, for instance, who had served on the Eastern Front, was obsessed with color field painting, and he made all these amazing uh, color field works in the colors of the sun and the colors of fire, and thought of the paintings as an energetic source. They should give you a feeling of emotional and spiritual cleansing, so very close to Rothko in that sense. Or people like Otto Pina, who was uh, one of the pioneers of the artist group Zero that was also hailed in America very early on as an important avant-garde in Europe. And he actually exposed these monochromatic, uh, monochromatic canvases to open fire sources and also thought of them as being um, energized, if you like, by the light of the sun. There should be meditative space, a cleansing space. And of course, there was always a sense for the German artists also to leave the kind of Nazi past behind these atrocities of the Second World War. And this idea of healing and the spiritual uh, is very closely linked to discourses you find in the same time uh, in, in American painting. So I think a very nice room to end the exhibition for a museum that, as a Barberini, is in a capital um, near the, uh, in the old GDR zone here in Brandenburg, but um, very close to, to Berlin as the German capital, of course, um, this uh, east-west divide that we had here in Germany was a focal point for discussions about the value of figuration and abstraction. And uh, Berlin was one of the cities where this idea of abstraction as being that universal language of the free world order was very much propagated. And I think you can get a sense of this rapprochement with, with France and America in this last room where the paintings look incredibly close in, in terms of their kinship of their stylistic proclivities with what is going on. Uh, at the same time in, in Paris and in New York. So an incredibly quick run through a lot of paintings, names and ideas, but I hope you could follow me and that we can now uh, hear a little bit more about how Stern and Biala were both instrumental in this uh, transnational dialogue and in that forging of abstraction as the new language of the avant-garde after 1945. Wow, encyclopedic. Uh, I love seeing the the European counterpart because um, work with my work with uh, with the with the Turkov and Biala estate, there was a lot of of correspondence. Uh, George Mathieu had sent mm. on his yeah. his manifesto in 1952, saying we were making abstract art just like everyone else was in the 40s. Um, you know, kind of in response to the American, the Great American Painting Tour, but organized by the Museum of Modern Art in 1952. Um, great, uh, thank you, Daniel. I'm, we're gonna segue here into discussion regarding the life and work of Janice Biala with Katerina. Um, I'm going to share my screen, dive right in. Um, hold on one second. 
Let me go back here. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, I hope people can hear me, see me. I'm in the same situation as Daniel was. All I can see is my PowerPoint here. Um, both artists lived extraordinary lives and their individual complexities certainly deserve focused discussion each on their own. But today instead, by way of introduction, I've prepared a few images that juxtapose the life and work of these two great artists. Biala and Stern immigrated to the United States. Um, okay, so can yes. we, can't, we can't see your PowerPoint. Okay, thanks. Let's try it again. There we go. Are we there now? Yes. Great. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Julia. Um, I wonder how long I would have been talking before someone said anything. <laughs> All right. They both immigrated to the United States. Biala immigrated with her mother and her brother, Jack Twerkoff, in 1913. And she returned to Paris in the early, in the late 20s, uh, lived there for uh, a decade with the novelist Ford Maddox Ford, returned to, to New York um, in uh, 1939 at the, um, on the death of, of Ford Maddox Ford and um, became immersed in the New York art world. Um, Hedda um, immigrated from Poland, and both of them shared early interest in becoming artists as they made their way. Um, both of them stood firm in an art world that was dominated by their male counterparts. Biala and Sturd made art the center of their lives. I believe that their lives would have intersected in Paris in the late 30s. Um, Hedda was exhibiting with the salon, um, in, in the independent salon, excuse my French, um, and so was Biala. Um, the art world was very small then, and I think that they would have known each other before they appeared together in this photo. Um, this capturing the artist session at Studio 35 in April 1950. It was a private and exclusive discussion among a group of artists on the ideas that were defining the current movement in abstract art in New York. Um, the, photos, the photos that we're seeing here by Max Yano, and um, they're typically reproduced so that you would see a lot of the men at the top, and then you can see that there's two women at the bottom. Um, if you direct your attention to the image on the right, you can see Louise Bourgeois, who was the only other woman that was invited to the discussion. Transcript of the discussion revealed that Biala and Stern were actively engaged in this conversation. Their male counterparts encouraged their involvement and asked them questions, were curious and supportive. Um, Biala says, like many of us, I was raised on the notion of painterliness, but what is moving in painting is a painterly quality. When I think of art I love, for example, the art of Spain and the passion and nobleness, I wonder if painterliness is not meant to serve something beyond itself. And Hedda said, I think that for an artist, the problem is not beauty ever. It's one of accuracy, validity, and life. Beauty is a matter of conception. And on the discussion of when you, when you think a painting is finished, Biala succinctly said, I never know when it's finished. I only know there comes a time when I have to stop. And Hedda, more philo philosophical, said, painting for me is a problem of simultaneous understanding and explaining. I try to approach my subject uncluttered by aesthetic prejudices and put it on canvas in order to explain it to myself, yet the result should reveal something plus. As I work, the thing takes life and fights back. There comes a moment when I can't continue, and that's when I stop. This photo was taken a few months after this famous photo. We can recognize some of the figures from the previous photo in this more historic photo that we've all come to recognize as the Irascibles by Nina Lean, uh, with Hedda, the only female featured standing on top of a box in the back. Um, both artists were married to cartoonists that worked for the New Yorker. B 
Biala married Daniel Bruceline, who signed his cartoons, Elen, and Hedda married Saul Steinberg. Um, Biala was married in July of 1942, Hedda seven months later in February 1943. Hedda said in, in an interview that in her apartment, no one knew when people would come to visit, no one knew she was an artist because there was never a painting of hers ever hung. go to here. Um, both artists shared uh, great companionships with Jack and Wally Twerkoff, Harold and May Rosenberg, Willem de Kooning, and Elaine de Kooning, Barnett and Annalee and, and Anna Newman, as well as friendships in Europe with Victor Brauner and Alberto Giacometti. Their friendship with Barnett and Annalee Newman are reflected in portraits of Annalee, painted around the same time, Biala's on the left and Hedda's is on the right. Yet as the allegiances, uh, another, as I previously mentioned, Harold Rosenberg was among their closest friends. Biala hosted him and his family like she did so many Americans looking for a stop off or a start place in Paris post-war. Harold uh, Rosenberg arrived in Paris in 1951 with his family and, and Biala invited him in and housed him, very close friends, yet their allegiances became, as his allegiances became intertwined with the rising art market for abstract expressionism, Biala's relationship with him, as well as with others, grew antagonistic, likely for the critics' critical classification of her work, as well as that as Hedda Stern, as School of Paris. And this provoked this letter dated from March 14th, 1966. Dear, dearest, darling, beloved Harold, the understudy of Clement Greenberg, you are fry when you are frying on a mountain of molten roses in the gardens of hell for your sins of omission and commission, as the good book haveth, Hedda Stern, Daniel Bruceline and I will, will out of our well-known school of Paris good taste, tastefully turn away our suffering, turn, turn away from your suffering. We will, however, indulge in quiet, sensuous enjoyment of same. In the hopes you that this finds you in the pink, which I'm sure it does, yours sincerely, your devoted friend, in God, a just one, I hope, J.B. Both artists had long transatlantic careers, Biala, bringing the gestural qualities to her portraits, interiors, and landscapes, and Stern examining um, and expanding her own interest in the poetic and the symbolic. It's wonderful to see their work so prominently orchestrated and included in this exhibition and in this dialogue. And here again are some specific, uh, the, specific the specific works that are in the exhibition. This is work by Biala, as Dan has already explained so eloquently. This is sort of the, there was a period of time when she made these very large uh, works in, for an exhibition at the Stable Gallery, um, and they were all based in uh, the still life. She always said that she had Matisse in her belly. This is her first museum acquisition that happened in 1955. This is uh, interior, uh, it's in the Whitney Museum. Black interior, black stove, cold water stove, second, uh, what was the other name of this? Cold water flat. There's many versions of this name, but basically we get it. Um, the black on black uh, really sort of draws you in. It's her, it's her, it's her way of, of us trying to figure out where we are, what we're doing, what's happening. And that little um, vessel that's on the table there is a is a um, French uh, uh, milk uh, container that um, that she owned with Ford Maddox Ford. It appears pretty fr frequently in a lot of her of her paintings, off and on. Yellow still life along the same lines. White interior with black kettle. And this is a great segue into uh, our discussion with Katerina. Um, this is still life with Ellie Poindexter. Ellie Poindexter was a, was a dealer um, in New York. This is 1957, and this is from the Awesome Collection. 
So um, we'll turn that, we'll go ahead and dive into this conversation with Katerina. Thanks for your patience and hanging in here with us. Um, uh, do I'll run your, I'll go ahead and run your PowerPoint. And yeah. perhaps you could talk about Stern's importance to the collection and 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 those 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 kinds of things. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Daniel, for uh, inviting me to join this very interesting discussion. Actually, because we don't speak enough about these two artists, which I think are really fascinating, especially their trajectories as well as their practice. Um, and we start with this beautiful view of had a next to Gottlieb and Pollock, which Daniel was talking already about. So quickly to, um, to remind that um, the collection, um, Assam collection is really built uh, around the idea of transnational vision of art history. Uh, we've been always fascinated with the artists who were born in a certain point of Europe or in the US and then the historical events of the 20th century disrupted their lives and they had to be to flee uh, Europe or to search an exile or uh, like in the case, for example, of John Mitchell on the country or even like, let's have an example of Twombly uh, go from the US and find their um, uh, recognition in Europe. So it's a very interesting point of how in the end the artists travel across continents, across canonical categories. And in the end, all these new experiences, sometimes hostile, sometimes more favorable, they really form their visual languages, which is very um, special. So um, when we learned about the uh, trajectory of um, Hedda's turn, we were extremely interested. And her work obviously supports uh, her very striking personality. And uh, just uh, to, 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 to sum up a little bit, uh, she's obviously born uh, in um, uh, Bucharest, but um, uh, the way she flees Europe to, to regain uh, New York, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating uh, because she's uh, has the stamps that decorate her passport uh, really create this kind of a geometrical line of cities. Uh, which is uh, from, let's say, uh, uh, Arad to Vienna, from Vienna to Munich, then to Barcelona, then to Madrid, Sintra, finally Lisbon, then she takes in the end this transatlantic um, journey to New York. So, and it's interesting that when she arrives to the US, I think it's, um, and it's like also the case of uh, Yana Chibiala, um, those artists, they had this position of an outsider which allowed them to be even more fascinated from that distant position with this new culture of the US, with the industrialization, with the speed of the city. And we'll obviously see that in, in Sterner's works. Um, and another point which supports our vision of transnational history uh, as an example of Sterner's is that the way she encapsulates in her life um, uh, surrealism, uh, which is so European, obviously, with uh, Victor Browner, who was her of, uh, of influence to her, also constructivism uh, with his fascination with machinery. Then she educates herself in the Parisian ateliers of Fernand Léger, uh, Atelier de la Grande Chamière. Uh, she participates with this uh, Salon des Sur Indépendants, with the Surrealist in 38 in Paris, captures attention of Jean Art, who um, in his turn uh, um, attracts attention of Peggy Guggenheim. So basically it's exceptional that when she finally arrives to New York, she's already just, her first call is Peggy Guggenheim uh, and she becomes really close with her. And she enters this very close, um, not very easy, I would say, um, society of immigrant artists from Breton, Duchamp, Piet Mondrian, and she's really at the equal with them. Um, when, for example, she participates in the Spring Salon in 1943 at Peggy Guggenheim's uh, Art of This Century, it's the first show that would promote Pollock, and she's already there, and it's not even her first show at, at Art of This Century, and she's with Bessie Otis, Motherwell, etc. Then she joins Betty Parsons, uh, who will become her um, dealer for, for quite a long time, and she's one of 16 artists that are the 
uh, represented by Parsons uh, from the very um, moment of uh, the gallery being founded with Rodko, Newman, Reinhardt. So it's extraordinary how this uh, emigre artist in the end brings uh, her independent vision and defends her um, transatlantic, transnational um, background. And um, I would like to uh, obviously um, focus a little bit more on the painting uh, which we start with, which is called New York Number no. 7 from 1954, which belongs to the series of road paintings. And they were inspired by um, the rush of traffic in New York, the highways, the bridges. Um, she's fascinated with this metropolitan life in the post-war America. She should be very different to um, Europe after war. And um, at the same time, she also loves the idea of machinery. And I think that these, obviously we see the wheel in the top uh, in the top right corner of the composition, but the central figure, which seems to be uh, human actually, is just a, a element of the car. It's actually a car hood ornament. And uh, she, in her own words, she says, um, Hedda says, when I came here, I became totally enthralled with the United States. I started painting my kitchen, the kitchen stove, the bathroom appliances, then I went out and painted Ford cars. So potentially it's one of these Ford cars that we are uh, seeing in New York number no. seven. And then I went out to the country and started painting industrial machines and the painted the roads. And um, another um, really unique point about Hedda is her use of the technique, the way she is in advance of her time. Um, she uses the spray aerosol paint that just has become yeah. available in the stores and just been invented. And she mixes it with um, the oil, with uh, uh, other mediums. And it's, 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 it's very interesting um, that it shows um, uh, obviously how she's captures to um, broaden the boundaries of painting and at the same time the technique is um, obviously um, air spray is very quick uh, when it's applied to the canvas and it's in line with the dynamics she's trying to capture so it's very interesting and who else is using that in um, the end of the 40s in the beginning 50s uh, because the series starts with uh, 1930, 1948 uh, if you follow uh, slightly further um, Jason okay there's an there's there's this just a close up showing this technique because she's really applying various layers of paint and she scraps parts of it away you know and she's um she's relentlessly reworking the surface so that's why I, I thought it would be interesting to zoom in um you know into into the surface and then the next uh work is this um 1954 new york series so it shows um another example from uh, Museum of Modern Art. So it's just the next one in the series after uh, New York number no. seven from our collection. And uh, it's exceptional how these works uh, immediately get uh, institutional recognition and curatorial support because uh, this particular work is included in uh, 28th uh, Venice Battle um, in an exhibition that would be called American Artists Paint the City. And it's acquired immediately in 54 by the Museum of Modern Art. The same happens with another painting, uh, if you would allow us to see the next slide. Yeah, here it is now in uh, MoMA next to David Smith and de Kooning. And the next slide is another series, uh, uh, road series, New York from 55, that is also acquired almost immediately by Whitney Museum in 56. And then Institute of Chicago, if, if you go on, yeah, here it is again, in, uh, now in Whitney next to uh, de Kooning. And the following shows us yeah, New York from 56, which is immediately acquired in the same year by our Institute of Chicago. So she is immediately uh, recognized. Um, and uh, um, I think uh, the interesting point is uh, she 
thinks of these landscapes uh, full of mechanical forms and the city. And it also sometimes she calls them an anthropographs. Uh, and she has this interesting quote that I would like to read. I had a feeling that machines are unconscious self-portraits of people's psyches, the grasping, the wanting, the aggression that is in a machine. So it's this peril finally of the American spirit of the capitalism, which is also um, captured in this abstract form. Um, and then if we go further, uh, I wanted just to show a few more examples of here it is next to Ed Clark uh, now in Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, then there are more works. Uh, and it's beautiful to see museums now putting had a next to uh, her male counterparts in their current uh, presentations of permanent collections. So you see the What's the Athenium uh, Museum uh, showing the New York number one. Um, then the other one would be um, Metropolitan Museum, uh, again, Metropolitan Museum, the 53 work, uh, which was part of the Epic Abstraction. And it's actually, that's one of the first instances I saw um, had his work in real, uh, in the flesh in 2018. It was the first time I saw it and I was fascinated. Uh, who is this unknown woman uh, next to Klein and Kooning? Um, and then the, the, the other slide would, yes, that would move us to this other series called Vertical Horizontal Series, uh, which shows uh, how Stern's journey into abstraction in the end brings you to a new pure forms more a meditative practice. Um, but again, I think if we zoom in the next slide, I'd like really to, to I mean, there, I don't think there are many people who have seen those works in the flesh and had the pleasure to really um, uh, dive into the surface. That's why I really like this close ups, which show how she captures the light, which seems to emanate from beyond, you know, this, uh, this canvas from uh, the inside and also shows the movement, the movement of light in this particular case. And again, many layers of paint, uh, uh, which uh, um, create this uh, contrast. She was referring to them as really delicate, but intense contrasts, really knife edge contrasts. And that brings us to other examples, I think from, um, the exhibition that uh, is was happened in Houston in the Manil connection, collection uh, well, with another work from this series where you see the contrasts are much more defined. Um, and then another example from our collection from 62, uh, which also um, um, compares itself very nicely with um, example from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, artist Institute of Chicago, the next slide. But basically, uh, she moves to this more calm abstraction also, uh, I think, um, in connection to her interest in the way Rodko is capturing light inside his paintings. She's really, you know, as you've seen from the images, she's um, fellows or with, uh, with them, with him. And also in 1962-63, she wins the scholarship, uh, the Fulbright scholarship to go to Venice that allows her to travel, to live in Dorsoduro, again, being there with Peggy Guggenheim, uh, which is so interesting the way she continues the journey. And obviously the Venice with its um, landscapes of uh, Laguna, of the light are reflected in this abstract landscapes. And again, she brings it uh, very interestingly in the connection to um, landscapes as portraits of humans. And as Eleanor Nairn in her brilliant essay about Hedda Sterner uh, for the 2019 uh, Victoria Mira catalog, she mentions that obviously she puts this vertical horizontal actually in the portrait format. So that would explain that maybe she captures the landscape but in a portrait format so again maybe there's this connection with a person personality the way she tried to capture the idea of uh, capitalism and industry and movement in the us she tries to capture uh, venetian people and she to quote her that's very interesting she, she speaks about these horizons 
as if a person might be made up of all the glinting horizons that they have ever seen. So beautiful, so poetic. And she continues, never before or after, never did I see such ethereal, practically immaterial, transparent, spiritual, beautiful, and sensitive looking people as in Venice. It's incredible, you see, so it's so deep. Uh, and uh, that's basically the reason of our fascination with Hedda Stern in the collection. And uh, that's why we're, we were so grateful uh, to Daniel to have included her work so prominently in his um, Pastum exhibition and that he is even, even more prominent to her work in the upcoming uh, Oslo presentation of this Turin exhibition. So thank you very much, Daniel, for that. Really, really important, I think, is in Europe for those works to be seen because they are very present in American institutions and absent of uh, European ones. Thank you. Another beautiful detail. Okay. All right. How are we doing? That was really great. Uh, thank you, Katerina. I really have appreciated that um, perspective uh, from someone outside of the estate and for someone who is who can who has that history of appreciation, um, both in New York and and in Europe. Um, you know, I was always been very fascinated by the spray paint uh, that she uses and uh, my work with another estate. Uh, Elizabeth Murray uh, really brings it into the fact that, you know, she was very much about portraying the grunginess of the city, but in this very ethereal way, almost like headlights in your face with those kinds of, of, of moments. Um, and I love that she never disguised that it was actually a sense of a spray, you know, almost like you're getting this mist in your own face when you look at those works. Um, Julia, do we have... Um, can we open up for questions? Do you all have about 10 minutes for questions? Does that, does that sound good? I have not received any questions. I'm okay. conscious of the fact that it's just after two o'clock here. Right. Um, so uh, if there are any questions, type them in now. And maybe, I don't know if you all have questions for each other. Well, I have one for Daniel, or Dan. Um, I was really interested in how you were going to uh, present both uh, the art formal and abstract expressionism. And um, I enjoyed the fact that the exhibition has this encyclopedic, you're in one place and now you're in another place. In your curatorial ideas with your thought, did you think of doing this abrupt juxtaposition? This is this painting by this artist made in New York or related to abstract expressionism? And is this the one that's in Western Europe? Curious about. Uh, yes, I mean, we've, to be honest, that was the biggest curatorial challenge in the show because um, at the beginning we thought it might make sense to have, you know, kind of Mathieu next to Pollock, you could have Klein next to Soulage. And actually there were exhibitions in uh, Europe uh, and in America um, early on in the 1940s and the early 1950s where these artists were shown together and where they made these very distinct groupings saying, you know, we take one American, we take uh, one European and they showed work that looks almost the same. And it's, it's, um, it's something we've, um, I was very conscious of in our exhibition that we're showing it's a transatlantic dialogue, but actually have to walk from one to the other. I would say the reason why we did it in the end is because the situation in New York is very different from the one in Paris as these two centers after the war. And there are things that make it very hard in terms of, you know, wall text explanation tours to like start with both immediately. So what in the end we decided to sort of begin in New York with that rise of the, of the abstract expressionists and have the way back to Europe saying, you know, these artists come into their own in New York in the late 1940s, but they all have their eyes on Paris and then see how it suddenly changes and they're both sort of on, on an equal dialogue, but it, it would have been um, been something nice to do. And I, I, I think it should be done more often. So I hope we, uh, you know, this, this sense of showing them together might also open up future exhibitions where they're shown in direct dialogue and where you sometimes have paintings one by the other. But um, it's uh, something we will uh, have in Oslo as well, the Americans first and the Europeans and at the second station in Vienna, 
um, it, it will be different. So they will be hung next to each other and you'll actually have a chance to see Europeans next to Americans. So I think it's also gonna be interesting for me to see it at other venues and what solutions will be found for say the same topic, but in a, in a um, different architecture and different settings. Oh, Jason, I think you're, um, you're still muted. These are all very challenging curatorial decisions, especially when you know your the size of the galleries that you have. You're, you're a lot of I don't think a lot of people understand that you know you'd like to be able to show many examples by one artist or show many examples by additional artists, and so you're sort of limited by that because there's the same thing was happening in Asia, and they were all learning about each other through these publications, these different. Um, magazines, news magazines that were coming out. Um, I, I don't remember exactly where I read this, but I read that a lot of the Europe, a lot of the American painting was being reproduced. Well, it was reproduced in art news, which was making it over to Europe, but the reproductions were all in black and white. Yeah. And so what the European end of that uh, side of that course, uh, response to that was, all we can see is the gestural nature of this work. We can't really see the details or the colors. And I don't know if you, in your curator, what you are looking at with the, with the breadth of some of these artists, if, if that was something that uh, you tuned into or they tuned into? Yes, I mean, this is what we know of a lot of artists, especially also in, in like in Germany, the abstract expressionists were shown um, much later than in, in, uh, in Paris. I think the first exhibition where they could be seen was in the early 1950s in in West Berlin, actually, which was really sort of also put on the political sign of you know friendship with the United States with these new lines they tried to forge, um, and uh, it, they did have the America House though, so these America houses, and and they had amazing libraries with contemporary arts. So we're pretty sure that a lot of the artists knew black and white illustrations of um, up and coming painting, but I think you shouldn't underestimate um, how many of the painters went to the exhibitions. You know, sometimes you read. It didn't have so many visitors. I think it's more important who visited it, like the Pollock exhibition um, at Studio Paul Facchetti. I think it only ran for something like 30 days, but we actually still have the guest book of it. And you know, you have Sam Francis, uh, Carol Apple went to see it, John Degotex, and a lot of the artists who didn't sign the guest book, we know from later interviews that they saw the exhibition and it obviously had lasting impact. Or, I mean, I, I was surprised by how many of these young painters had traveled to uh, Venice in 1948 and actually saw Kooning and Pollock uh, in uh, in the flesh for the first time. And I mean, one example uh, one example I quoted was was Rival, who traveled to um, uh, to the Biennale, and she was so taken with Pollock and uh, and the Kooning that she subscribed to American um, magazines to be able to see these black and white illustrations. And she actually said that it was so important for her seeing what was going on in Europe that in America, although she lived in Paris, she said the New York school was more of a guideline for her. And I think it's something, I mean, if you look at our catalog, for instance, it's really traced in more detail who sees what at what time. And it also is the Americans um, who uh, buy or exhibit uh, Europeans, of course, and there's big exhibitions happening in New York in the 1950s where Afamel painting is shown. It's a lot of interesting acquisitions going on very early. So it's it's something that needs to be explored further, I think. Oh, Jason, sorry, I think you're just muted again. Oh. <laughs> I need to rehearse the mute button. Sorry, guys. Um, I think there's always this discussion too about what came first and yeah. who who got to that throw through the paint first or who undid the unstretched canvas or who, you know, you know, um, that that dialogue neglects the fact that there was this conversation between artists and, and artists appreciating each other's work. I'm going to drop into the chat a really interesting um, Georges Matteo. Um, I'm pronouncing his name correct, right? Correct, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, he had this little treatise that he wrote um, and sent it out to all of the artists that were part of this great American movement. Uh, Betty Parsons, if you can find it in the Archives of American Art, Betty, Betty Parsons. But he's kind of, in his letter to Jack Twerkoff, not, he kind of puts a little bit of a knife into it saying, if you read it really closely, it's like, look, we've been doing this stuff. You've been doing this stuff. You've got the institutional placement behind it, which is really kind of exciting. Um, but it's an interesting way to kind of bring 
all of these different ideas back around onto each other again, that these artists were not, while they wanted to and, and definitely did work in an isolated way in their studios and in their minds, they were always, the, the art that they were making was part of the life they were living and where they were living. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I mean, yeah. Matthew is really interesting because he is, he, he's, you know, he's fluent in English. He has his eyes set on New York. He works for um, uh, United States lines. And um, he's, uh, at the same time, you know, he, he kind of develops these things also sort of independently, right? There's um, actually a really nice drip painting by him made in the mid 1940s. So before Pollock drips, you have like a really pure drip painting by him, which will actually show in Oslo. Um, but um, I, th I think that's uh, maybe, Katrina, you can talk a bit more about this. I think in, in your collection is really so great that you build it all on this idea of the transnational and like trying to break down these boundaries because I think what's happening often in art history is that, you know, we think in periods or we think in, in geographical boundaries. And so Paris is completely separate from New York. And like when you go for sort of the, the big streamlined histories of art, it always seems that Alfred Mel is something completely different from abstract expressionism. All they were happening at the same time with these artists knowing each other, seeing each other's work. So I think it's, it's a real strength of your collection that you have that dialogue very integral to it. Well, thank you. But indeed, I think one would not have existed with the other, like any uh, revolution, it happens as a reaction to something else that was prior to it. So the way the Americans reacted and uh, revolted against the uh, European uh, art informel, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's also, I mean, unparalleled, but in a way uh, breaking this, um, tradition of the old world. And Mathieu is indeed is a curious artist because he's he had this larger than life personality, uh, almost at the border of a performance artist, to be honest, because he was <laughs> doing those uh, drip uh, straight from the paint mm. tubes um, compositions, literally within 30 minutes, an hour. And he was this turning point for Michel Tapier. You know, they were traveling together to Japan to be with the Good Time Movement. Then he would be in New York and he wouldn't obviously take any paintings because he likes these large scale paintings. He wouldn't really like to um, roll them uh, on a transatlantic ship. So basically he'll be in the studio of some um, uh, galleries to New York and will create all of them within one day, you know? And it was, um, wherever, where have you seen it? Uh, <laughs> and in uh, Vienna, we will be showing this work that was created particularly for Vienna, listening to Viennese classical music within four hours. And it's a six meter long, very richly and densely populated canvas. And I had actually a question for you, obviously, Daniel, because I was fascinated looking at the way from 2018 to final, incarnation of this exhibition in 2020, quite a long time. And so you really being specialist in a, initially in a different period, you went through a lot of research and also research which already exists out there in the terms of, you know, Pollock and Barnett Newman, it's mm. very obvious, but for the, so many artists that you've been bringing uh, to, from the unknown territory to your walls, I'm curious, how was the, your selection process uh, based, what were the criteria? How would you go for, uh, let's say, Twarka, Piala, Sterner, uh, Janet Sobel? Like, was it the exhibition history of those artists? Was there any particular um, friendships they had? Obviously the quality of the work, like what were your criteria in your research process? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's there's some painters you you sort of can't leave out and have that canonical role, and it's it seems to me incontrovertibly justified. in, in terms of also, if you see other artists' statement, like I mean, Pollock was such an important icebreaker, right? And so um, there are some artists that were on the list as sort of kind of we need them to tell the story, and at the same time, like I would have you know, do you need 10 Pollocks? You can make the point with three or four, right? Same with, with Rothko and Newman. 
And so we, with a lot of the artists, uh, my idea was, you know, try to get like 50 to 60 and some of them could be represented with one work. And our idea was has to be work that's sort of top class, right? So you want to present them with, with some of their best works. Um, and we wanted to have um, around the same amount of uh, American paintings and European paintings. And it, it was important for us to have new discoveries in the show because I think, you know, there's the uh, Royal Academy show, for instance, that David Antrim curated was so phenomenal, it was one of the exhibitions I love the most, but it didn't bring ma many new positions to the fore. And I think it's also quite nice for visitors when they walk through something, you know, they might come to see the Newmans they like, or they, you know, are already Rothko fans. And it actually happened in our exhibition, like with a lot of the press reviews and also with, with people um, sort of, uh, you know, giving direct feedback to us, like, you know, their, their favorite works were Biala, Stern, they loved Frankenthal and Krasner, they loved Abbott uh, or Pearl Fine. So um, th that was really nice to hear that that kind of strategy worked, you know, having these iconic works but uh, also amazing paintings by artists who need to be shown more often. And um, I mean, you know, it's, it's something we will also see in, in Vienna and in Oslo with, with different selections and where uh, institutions curators made, made different choices. And uh, the, um, let's say the artist we had in our exhibition, I think it was here in Potsdam 54. It's not meant to be a post statement about that's, you know, the truth that's like canon, not, not at all. You know, it's constantly changing how we construct the history of art, but I, I wanted to give a sort of representative cross-section, if you like, um, and I, I think it worked. And of course it was also important, you know, kind of, um, you mentioned it, I've worked on it since 2018. There were a lot of dialogue partners and, you know, a lot of gallerists, a lot of colleagues at the museum. So um, I, I was very fortunate to get a lot of advice. People saying, you know, have you actually looked at Biala? Have you looked at Stern? Do you know about Remington? You know, people sending me brochures are saying, have a look at this catalog. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I think um, it, it was um, yeah, really good to be able to sort of go piece by piece in that exhibition. Well, I want to thank you both. I understand that the, the catalog is on back order, but get it. It's, I've indexed it. I've read it a dozen times. It's great. Um, so get that order in. The, there's some links on the side there if you'd like to follow uh, the workings of some of the of, of Janice Biala um, and Hedda Stern. Open for comments and emails. So just send them our way. If you have anything to follow up, we can send it on to uh, Dan and to Katerina. And I want to thank you both for taking this time today. Um, thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing our, uh, finding another way to collaborate and looking forward to the next projects that you're both involved with. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, Katrina. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.